Pacific War in a way beyond the imagination of any of the visionary pre-war strategists. None of the Japanese or American planning had been conducted with any idea of the two weapons which would bring the war so completely and so suddenly to an end. The Boeing Super Fortress and the atomic bomb. Conventional air power had gone a long way toward defeating the Japanese. But they were determined to resist an invasion with every weapon at their disposal. The Japanese were a homogeneous nation, 100 million strong. They were willing to die for their country and their emperor. The Boeing B-29 was the most expensive single project of World War II. It cost more than $3 billion for design, development, production, and deployment. The Manhattan Project, which resulted in the atomic bomb, cost $2 billion. The B-29 was clearly the most outstanding bomber of the war by any standard of performance. It was far ahead of the American B-17 and the British Lancaster. The Super Fortress was the joint project of a few visionary American Air Corps planners. They were aided by the courage of General Hap Arnold, who pushed the program through in spite of many hazards. That is safe from attack by air. The other important factor was the engineering strength and heavy bomber experience of the Boeing Aircraft Corporation. By 1940, it seemed possible that England would be invaded and occupied. That meant that Nazi Germany would have to be bombed from U.S. bases. The Air Corps called for a speed of 400 miles an hour, a range of 5,333 miles, and a 2,000-pound bomb load. It was an audacious gamble on the part of the Air Corps and of the Boeing Company. Boeing was perhaps taking the greater chance the Air Corps could hedge its bets with other manufacturers for less ambitious airplanes. But Boeing had to rely not only on its own capability, it also had to trust its vendors. Many of them were being asked to create components fully as advanced as the aircraft itself. Shortcuts had to be taken, each one added to an already ambitious program. Dollars were freely available, but they were not always a solution. The handsome, streamlined airframe was a radical departure from all previous Boeing practice. It involved new metals and new fabrication techniques. Boeing's entire production capacity was occupied with building the B-17. For the B-29, it was necessary to build entire new plants, and there was a greater challenge the creation of a new, highly skilled workforce. Vast schools were established on the factory sites. With 90 days of training or less, farmers, housewives, and young people just out of high school were taught how to do everything necessary to build the most complex aircraft in history. By 1943, Boeing had 58,000 employees building the B-29. Boeing knew from the start that the greatest question mark was the unproven engine. The 18-cylinder Wright R3350 used two General Electric turbochargers to develop almost one horsepower for each pound of engine weight. The R3350 needed several years more development than was available. It would go into the field unready. It would be a constant nightmare to mechanics and a worry to pilots taking off with two heavy loads from two short runways. Even with the R-3350's power, the speed and range requirements were difficult to attain. They could only be achieved by combining a highly streamlined design with a wing using a new Boeing high-lift airfoil and a sophisticated flap system. The USAAF thought Boeing's approach was too radical. They thought the wing loading was too high and that pilots wouldn't be able to handle the airplane. They cited the experience of the notorious Martin B-26 as an example. 
Boeing analyzed the B-26 and found that it had a low aspect ratio wing mounted on the fuselage in a way that induced drag. They explained that the B-26's problem stemmed from bad design. They said that the B-29's excellent design would avoid difficulties. To achieve the necessary performance, the B-29 had to operate at high altitudes. For this, pressurization of the fuselage was mandatory. Boeing had experimented with pressurization in the Model 307 Stratoliner passenger plane, but no production bomber had ever been pressurized. The B-29 adopted a new three-bubble system. The pilot, co-pilot, engineer, radio operator, and navigator were in the front pod. The gunners were positioned in the mid-fuselage pressurized area and connected to the cockpit by a tunnel spanning the twin bomb bays. The tail gunner was crammed into a third pressurized compartment in the rear, isolated and very much alone. Because of the pressurization system, standard gun turrets could not be used. The armament had to be remotely operated. A general electric fire control system had to be created. It used an early computer that compensated for speed, range, altitude, wind, temperature, and trajectory. The results were remarkably good. Any gunner apart from the tail gunner could control more than one station. The computer permitted firing at targets beyond the range of conventional hand-operated guns. Demand for the Boeing B-29 increased. Rival firms, Bell Aircraft and Glen L. Martin, were tasked to build it. Boeing felt it was being asked to train competition for the post-war marketplace. By the time the XB-29 made its first flight on September 21st, 1942, the USAAF had placed a mammoth order for 1,664 of the aircraft. But the first two prototypes caught fire in the air. The second one crashed into a meatpacking plant. The entire crew was killed. In spite of all the difficulties, the first B-29 of the 58th Bombardment Wing landed at Karagpur, India on April 24, 1944 to begin Operation Matterhorn. Operation Matterhorn was designed to knock out the Japanese steel industry. The idea of B-29s bombing Japan from Chinese bases was attractive in political terms. President Roosevelt had promised Chiang Kai-shek to begin bombing operations against Japan by November 1944. But in practice, it was flawed for a wide variety of economic, logistic, and command reasons. Chiang Kai-shek's subordinates refused to get serious about building air bases until enough money had been paid to permit embezzlement on a massive scale. Army General Vinegar Joe Stilwell estimated that at least half of the $100 million in gold required by the Chinese was siphoned off to corrupt officials. The air bases themselves were a monument to the patience and industry of the Chinese people. They literally built them by hand, without power equipment of any sort. They used the most primitive tools to move earth or chip stones. The operation was based on the assumption that the B-29s would support their own operations by flying gasoline over the hump, the high mountain passes in the Himalayas, separating India and China. The B-29s would be supported by a fleet of B-24s serving as tankers. But the B-29 was a brand new weapon that had not received sufficient testing. It would be bad practice to subject it to continuous flights over the mountains. Then there was the primitive maintenance and the continuing shortage of parts and labor. But the task had to be done. There was no alternative. The complexity of the logistics was a function of the sheer size of the B-29 units. The Superfortress had a crew of seven, 
Seven aircraft were assigned per squadron. There were 28 per group and a grand total of 112 for the wing. Each B-29 was assigned two crews. A fully manned wing had a total personnel of 11,112. When all its elements arrived overseas, 20th Bomber Command had more than 20,000 officers and men plunked down in brand new bases in India and China, eager to go to war. Lieutenant General George Stratemeyer was made responsible for the 20th Bomber Command's administration and logistics. General Claire Chenault was responsible for the fighter defense and complete ground support of the B-29 bases in China. The B-29's very first combat raid was mounted on June 5, 1944. General Wolfe led 98 aircraft against the railroad marshalling yards in Bangkok, Thailand. Five aircraft crashed en route. 42 had to make emergency landings. Later reconnaissance revealed that fewer than 20 bombs had landed in the target area. It was not a good start for a $3 billion program. The commanders were veterans of the European theater. They were not yet aware of how different the B-29 was from the B-17. Nor were they aware of how difficult the Japanese targets, geography, and weather were compared to Germany's. Hap Arnold demanded better results. He wanted an attack on the Japanese homeland. On June 15th, Wolf launched 92 B-29s from India. Of these, only 79 reached their Chinese staging bases. 78 were dispatched on a night raid against the steel mills at Yawata on Kyushu, Japan. Each plane carried two tons of bombs. Results were once again disappointing. Only 47 aircraft made it to Yawata. Only one bomb hit Yawata. It damaged a power station more than half a mile from the steel mill coke ovens. The Americans took comfort in the damage they must have caused to Japanese morale. But Arnold was not after Japanese morale. He was after their industry. The story of the next six months was much the same. And at home in the U.S., there was a myriad of B-29 production problems. Wolf was sent back to sort them out. In September, the 20th Bomber Command was taken over by a firebrand from Europe. His name was Curtis LeMay. The dramatic acceleration of the Pacific War, including the capture of the Marianas in the summer of 1944, permitted a two-pronged strategy of attack. From bases in Chengdu, China, the 1,600-mile operating radius of the B-29 permitted it to hit targets from Manchuria through Japan all the way down to the tip of French Indochina. Super fortresses operating from Saipan and the Marianas could cover all the important targets in the heartland of Japan. Curtis LeMay's 20th Bomber Command was the first of the two prongs. To provide the second, the 21st Bomber Command was established in November 1944. It was to operate out of new airfields in the Marianas Islands. One of the United States Army Air Force's great planners, Hassam Hansel, was made commanding officer of the 21st. Hansel landed his B-29, Jolton Josie, the Pacific Pioneer, on Saipan on October 12, 1944. He was eager to validate in battle the many plans he'd participated in creating. He took enormous satisfaction from the knowledge that the B-29s were operating from Saipan because he'd persuaded the Joint Chiefs of Staff to bypass the island of Truk and seize the Marianas as a base. Well, the, the first element of the 21st Bomber Command has arrived. When we've done some more fighting, we'll do some more talking. Hansel felt the weight of his responsibility. He knew that even Curtis LeMay, in spite of his success in Europe, 
was having trouble turning things around against the Japanese in China. LeMay's problems with the 20th Command included difficulty of supply and the unreliability of the B-29's R-3350 engines. Occasionally, good bombing results were obtained, but the damage to the Japanese did not justify the cost and effort of the B-29 program. In April 1945, the assets of the 20th Bomber Command would be transferred to Tinian and Guam. By then, it had failed in its essential task of sustained bombing of Japan. The courage and hard work of the 20th Bomber Command were simply insufficient to overcome impossible logistics, even with Curtis LeMay as their leader. So much had been expected of the B-29 that the American commanders were driven to prove that it was, in fact, an excellent weapon. At the very highest levels of command, where people were aware of the Manhattan Project, the urgency was even greater. Only the B-29 could carry the atomic bomb. If the superfortress failed, the Manhattan Project became a complete waste. The pressure was felt and transmitted. But in the months after his arrival on Saipan with the 21st, Hassam Hansel was able to do no better than had previously been done by the 20th from China. The Committee of Operational Analysis had reconsidered the priorities in Japan. They now suggested that the aviation industry was the most important target. This had been the Air Force's choice all along. The Joint Chiefs of Staff directed that the principal aircraft engine manufacturers around Tokyo become the primary targets. The long series of attacks on Tokyo would be helped by the incredible bravery and skill of the crew of an F-13. The F-13 was the unarmed reconnaissance version of the Super Fortress. Early in the morning of November 1st, 1944, Captain Ralph D. Steakley's F-13 became the first U.S. plane to fly over Tokyo since the Doolittle Raid. The weather was clear. Steakley took the first ever reconnaissance photos of Tokyo. These photos became the basis for all U.S. attacks on the city. Hansel's first strike on Tokyo was to be called San Antonio 1. After much training and many postponements, San Antonio 1 began at 6.15 a.m. on November 24th. The first plane to roll down Isley Field's runway was Dauntless Dottie, flown by Brigadier General Rosie O'Donnell. His co-pilot, Major Robert K. Morgan, had been a pilot on the famous B-17 Memphis Bell. Dauntless Dottie was followed by 110 more B-29s, carrying 278 tons of bombs. But the promising start to the mission unraveled. 17 aircraft aborted. Six more found themselves unable to bomb for mechanical reasons. The rest were caught up in a 120 knot wind. It was the infamous jet stream, then only just being recognized. They were swept over the target at a blistering 445 miles an hour. It was too fast for accurate bombing. But on the positive side, Japanese fighter resistance was light. Flak was ineffective. Once again, reconnaissance photos showed the bombing results to be totally inadequate. Only 16 bombs had been observed to hit the target area. By now, the B-29 was performing fairly well. Extensive modifications had improved the reliability of its engines, but bombs were still not hitting the targets. The early Japanese analysis was that the costs of the B-29 were so great and its results so negligible that not even a wealthy nation like the United States could afford to persist in the attacks.
but unknown to all of the Japanese and most of the Americans, a change was in the wind. On December 18, 1944, 84 B-29s of Curtis LeMay's 20th Bomber Command dropped 500 incendiary bombs in a daylight raid on Hankou, China. The attack destroyed the city as a major Japanese base. As a result of the success of LeMay's incendiary raid, Hansel's 21st Bomber Command was ordered to make a test raid on the city of Nagoya in Japan. It would be made by at least 100 B-29s, all dropping incendiary bombs. Hansel objected, saying that he wanted to continue precision bombing of the Japanese aircraft industry. In doing so, he put his career on the skids. You can buck the brass in the military, but only if you succeed. A test raid was run on Nagoya on January 3, 1945. 97 B-29s carried mostly incendiary bombs. It was not a good mission. Only 57 aircraft bombed the designated target. Damage on the ground was slight. The Japanese drew the conclusion that their fire prevention system was highly efficient. It was an erroneous and eventually disastrous assumption. Hansel reverted to his previous precision bombing tactics. He was unable to generate better results, apart from one successful attack on the Kawasaki aircraft plant near Kobe. That one success didn't help Hansel. If you worked for Hap Arnold, you delivered or you were relieved. Hansel was relieved by Major General Curtis E. LeMay. Hansel's forte was planning. The time for planning was past. Now was the time for direct action, which was Curtis LeMay's strength. As a new commander, LeMay received more latitude than Hansel. He made two attacks using Hansel's methods. Then he put 69 aircraft over Kobe to drop incendiary bombs. There was heavy fighter opposition. Two B-29s were lost and 35 were badly damaged. But the city of Kobe was hurt. More than a thousand buildings were destroyed. In the latter part of the war, America's overwhelming advantage in numbers and quality usually allowed American forces to brush Japanese opposition aside. As the precision bombing efforts continued, further tests were made with incendiary bombs. In a heavy attack on Tokyo on February 25th, almost 30,000 buildings were destroyed but the precision strikes against Japan continued to be ineffective. Enemy fighter opposition stiffened. In the series of attacks in February, 29 B-29s were lost to fighters, 10 were lost to flak. Almost as many were lost on the long overwater trip between Saipan and Japan. Another 21 crashed because of operational problems like engine fires, runaway propellers, or fuel exhaustion. And so far, the results were insignificant. The B-29, the multi-billion dollar bomber, had failed in its intended role. Curtis LeMay already had the remedy in mind. LeMay was aware that he was as vulnerable to Hap Arnold's impatience as any other man. He decided to try tactics he'd long considered and which had been carefully tested in the United States. It was the common opinion that Japanese cities were much more vulnerable to firebombing than those of Germany. And although Japanese industry was spread out into residential areas, 
it was still far more concentrated than its German counterpart. The B-29 had been designed from the start as a high-altitude bomber. In the European theater, it would have had to remain so. But conditions were different in Japan. Anti-aircraft guns and searchlights were not radar controlled. It was reported that there were only two night fighter units in the homeland. Japanese airborne radar was primitive and not widely used. Without notifying General Arnold, LeMay decided to launch a series of maximum effort, low-level incendiary night attacks against Japan. He was putting his career on the line. Night bombing offered many advantages. The winds were not so strong. The B-29's navigation system operated more efficiently. Flying at lower altitude eased the strain on the engines. It lowered fuel consumption. Leaving behind armament and ammunition permitted a much bigger bomb load, about 12,000 pounds per plane. The concept of unarmed, low-level night bombing alarmed many of LeMay's staff. The word murder was quietly mentioned, but never to LeMay. The first raid was set for the night of March 9th, 334 B-29s carried almost 2,000 tons of bombs. The aircraft in the lead squadrons were to act as pathfinders. Their napalm bombs were intended to start major appliance fires, which would require the mobilization of all the Japanese firefighting equipment. The rest of the B-29s each carried 24 cluster units of M-69 incendiary bombs. The M69 was designed by a high-level group of American scientists and engineers, some of whom were also involved in the Manhattan Project. Each M69 was only 20 inches long and 3 inches in diameter. It weighed just over 6 pounds. On crashing through the roof of its target, it was designed to detonate and spew out flaming gel as far as 30 yards. The gel stuck to whatever it hit and burned with hellish intensity. The technology of the M69 and the great logistics and supply effort needed to deliver it to its target was an expression of the disparity between the American and Japanese war machines in 1945. The Japanese simply had no counter and no equivalent. On the evening of March 9th, it took almost three hours for LeMay's entire force of B-29s to get airborne. The bombers would approach Tokyo individually at altitudes from 4,900 to 9,200 feet. Over Tokyo, the visibility was 10 miles or better. The napalm bombs of the Pathfinder aircraft started fires that were fanned by a brisk and rising wind. The initial attack hit a 12-mile square of the most densely populated part of the city. The fires spread rapidly and the results were devastating. The fire services were overwhelmed within 30 minutes of the first attack. A firestorm swept the city. More than a quarter of a million buildings were destroyed. More than a quarter of the city's houses were gone. More than a million people were homeless. 83,000 were dead. 160,000 were injured. The Japanese were horror-stricken. There was no way to comprehend a disaster of this magnitude. It completely overrode ideas of national superiority and of the samurai spirit and of the nation's place in the sun. On March 11th, the city of Nagoya became the target for incendiary attack. There was no firestorm, but two square miles of the city were destroyed. Osaka was attacked on March 13th. The city was blanketed by cloud cover, and the B-29s were forced to use radar bombing. Unexpectedly, that gave more uniform results than visual bombing. 
Within three hours, more than eight square miles of the city were totally destroyed. Morale in the B-29 units kept climbing. LeMay had found the magic formula. He made maximum use of the B-29 in tactics that took advantage of the enemy's weaknesses. These tactics converted the B-29 from a blunder to a war winner. LeMay was on a rampage. He drove his crews hard. They were already flying 60 hours a month. That was higher than the average of the 8th Air Force in Europe. But there was a shortage of replacements, and that shortage forced LeMay to increase monthly combat time to 80 hours. He had the scent of victory in his nostrils, victory over Japan, and victory for the concept of air power. LeMay knew that he had arrived at a point that General Carl Spotts and Bomber Harris had only dreamed of. He had the ultimate weapon at his disposal, and he knew that there was more to come. He believed that with maximum effort, his command could destroy Japan's ability to wage war. The strength of the 21st Bomber Command grew every day. By April, LeMay had more than 500 aircraft at his disposal. On May 11th, he launched a further attack on three Japanese cities. His goal was to create such havoc that the terrible cost America had borne invading Okinawa would not be repeated in Japan. By June 15th, he had destroyed 112 square miles of Tokyo, Nagoya, Kobe, Osaka, Yokohama, and Kawasaki. His B-29s now had the benefit of long-range escort fighters, P-51s from Iwo Jima. LeMay had destroyed the six principal industrial cities of Japan at a cost of 136 aircraft. The American loss rate, 1.9%, was acceptable but the reality of it was still horrific. Japan was not able to stop this destruction. It lacked anti-aircraft guns, radar, fighters to repel the invaders. It lacked fire engines, bomb shelters, and hospitals to help its citizens. Yet Japan was held captive by a martial spirit. That spirit had served the country ill on almost every battlefield in this war, but the government vowed to fight on. LeMay and the 21st Bomber Command had brought Japan to its knees, but it would not surrender. The B-29's success in area bombing was a great relief to all those who had staked so much on its development. At the time, few people were aware of the Manhattan Project and the essential role the B-29 would have in the successful delivery of an atomic weapon. By July 1941, a decision had been made to create an atomic bomb before the Germans did. The Manhattan Project eventually employed 120,000 people, including the country's top engineers and scientists. The mammoth $2 billion effort had its first success at Almogordo, New Mexico. On July 16, 1945, an experimental bomb was detonated with results that were incredible even to those who had created it. Word of the successful test was immediately sent to the new president, Harry S. Truman. Truman, who was a novice, was plunged into the Potsdam Conference with Winston Churchill and Joseph Stalin. 
The atomic bomb buoyed Truman's confidence. It also gave him a stronger hand in dealing with the Soviet Union. Truman mentioned to Stalin that a powerful new weapon had been tested. Stalin responded that he hoped it would be used to good effect against the Japanese. Truman was pleased that Stalin did not press for more information. He was unaware that Stalin already knew what he needed to know from the Soviet spies at the center of the Manhattan Project. The Potsdam Declaration of July 26th indirectly warned the Japanese of the power of the new weapon. It stated that the only alternative to surrender was prompt and utter destruction. Japan was badly wounded by the B-29 raids. It was also cut off from food and industrial imports. Japanese leaders were fully aware that the war was lost, but as yet had not found a way to acknowledge it. A cultural phenomenon emerged, unfamiliar to the West. It was mokusatsu, a time-honored technique by which a Japanese officer would take refuge in lofty silence if he did not agree with or did not understand an order. When the new Japanese Prime Minister Suzuki announced his response to the Potsdam Declaration. He used the term mokusatsu. He meant to say, in essence, no comment. But his remarks were translated as meaning that Japan was contemptuously ignoring the declaration. It was a fatal error. In early 1944, plans for modifying 15 B-29s were formulated. The modifications were not extensive. The atomic bombs were being designed at the same time. The designs were adapted as much as possible to fit the B-29's bomb bay. The following summer, Arnold authorized a top secret team of experts to create the first combat unit to use the new weapon. Colonel Paul W. Tibbetts, Jr. was elected as commander of the new 509th Composite Group. The remainder of the group was handpicked to get the best possible people. For a long time, Tibbetts was the only person in the 509th to know the true nature of the mission. The special facilities required for handling and loading the atomic bomb were prepared on Tinian in the spring of 1945. By July, the 509th and its specially modified B-29s were in place. Further training began immediately with six specialized missions. Some of them involved harassment bombing of isolated garrisons on the islands of Truk and Marcus. After July 20th, the 509th crews executed 38 sorties, gaining experience in the precise tactics to be used when the atomic bomb was dropped. These sorties also made the sight of small formations of B-29s seem customary and innocuous to the Japanese. A list of target cities was drawn up. It included Kyoto, Hiroshima, Niigata, and Kukura. They were the largest cities with the least damage remaining in Japan. Kyoto was removed because of its cultural significance and because of the negative reaction in Europe to the bombing of Dresden. Truman and Secretary Stimson felt the destruction of Kyoto might drive Japan into the Russian camp after the war. Hiroshima was now at the head of the line. Later, Nagasaki was added to the list. On Tinian, all the necessary elements of the strike were prepared. Field Order No. 13 was signed on August 2, 1945, by Lieutenant General Nathan Twining. It directed the 509th Group to make a visual attack on Hiroshima. At one time, Hiroshima had been a busy naval port, but the port had been mined and now the population was reduced to under a quarter of a million people. There were many military installations. The entire economy was geared to the Japanese war effort. There were no allied prisoner of war camps in the area. Seven aircraft were assigned to the mission. Leading the principal force was Tibbets in Enola Gay, named after his mother. Enola Gay was accompanied by two escort planes, crammed with cameras and observers to record the event. 
three aircraft were assigned duty as weather planes. One was designated a spare. On August 4th, the crews were told of the exact nature of their mission and of the bomb's predicted 20,000 tons of TNT power. But even then, they were not told it was an atomic bomb. At 2.45 in the morning of August 6th, the Enola Gay took off. Five and a half hours later, Tibbetts received word that weather and visibility were good. At exactly 0915, Enola Gay was flying at 328 miles an hour at 31,600 feet. Bombardier Major Thomas Farabee dropped the bomb. Tibbets then executed what later became known as a breakaway maneuver, a steeply banked 150 degree turn to avoid the expected blast. By the time the bomb exploded, 50 seconds later, the Enola Gay was 19 miles away. At detonation, there occurred the fireball, followed by the swiftly rising mass of smoke that turned into the notorious mushroom cloud the cloud that still casts its symbolic shadow. President Truman immediately announced the event to the world. The news amazed even many members of the 509th Composite Group. The Japanese reaction was confused. Officially, they diminished the results of the attack they said only that it was a new bomb which should not be made light of. Certainly not. 4.7 square miles of Hiroshima's center had been obliterated. More than 40,000 buildings were destroyed. Almost 80,000 people were killed. 171,000 were made homeless. The May B-29s and the U.S. Navy carrier forces maintained pressure against Japan while the sole remaining atomic weapon in the world was prepared for use. The second and last atomic mission of the war began at 0349 on August 9th. Major Sweeney and his crew flew boxcar. They traded their aircraft, the Great Artiste, to Captain Frederick C. Bach. Sweeney's mission was as troublesome as Tibbets had been trouble-free. The primary target was Kokura, but it was weathered in. Sweeney made three bomb runs. The bombardier couldn't see the target visually. Some Japanese fighters were in the area. Sweeney diverted to the secondary target, Nagasaki, which was also cloud covered. Boxcar used radar for its run in. At the last minute, the bombardier, Captain Kermit Behan, saw the target. At 10.58, he hit the bomb release. Most people were either at work or at home when the bomb detonated within one mile of two huge Mitsubishi arms factories. Nagasaki's bowl-shaped terrain confined the effects of the bomb to a relatively small 1.45 square mile area. Approximately 35,000 people were killed. Incredibly, 
Emperor Hirohito's advisors on the Supreme Council for the Direction of the War still debated whether or not to surrender. As Adolf Hitler had done, the military faction still wanted to resist in the hope of obtaining better terms. On August 19th, the Japanese announced not their surrender, but their willingness to accept the Potsdam Declaration, as long as it did not prejudice the prerogatives of the emperor as sovereign. In the days preceding the Japanese statement, routine B-29 missions had continued. On August 11th, they were suspended to give negotiations a chance to mature. The United States responded to the August 10th Japanese statement by advising that from the moment of surrender, the authority of the emperor and the Japanese government were subject to the supreme commander of the allied powers. It added that the ultimate form of the government of Japan shall be by the freely expressed will of the Japanese people. When no word came back from the Japanese government, LeMay's B-29s were authorized to resume attacks. General Arnold had long wanted his own Tokyo Millennium, a thousand aircraft over Tokyo, while General Spatz would have preferred to use a third atomic bomb if one had been available. LeMay was able to meet Arnold's wish. He put up a total of 828 bombers and 186 fighters over a thousand aircraft in all over Tokyo on August 14th. Before the last aircraft had landed, Japan had surrendered. The American forces continued to make a display of air power over Japan. This reached a highlight on September 2nd. 462 B-29s cruised over Tokyo Bay while the surrender was signed aboard the USS Missouri. In the meantime, 900 B-29s had dropped almost 5,000 tons of supplies to more than 63,000 prisoners of war in camps in Japan, China, and Korea. The initial drops were medicine, vitamins, food, and clothing. These were followed by regular weekly drops until the prisoners were evacuated. As in Europe, it was probably the only humane way to end a vicious war. performance. It was far ahead of the American B-17 and the British Lancaster. The Superfortress was the joint project of a few visionary American Air Corps planners. They were aided by the courage of General Hap Arnold, who pushed the program through in spite of many hazards. That is safe from attack by air. The other important factor was the engineering strength and heavy bomber experience of the Boeing Aircraft Corporation. By 1940, it seemed possible that England would be invaded and occupied. That meant that Nazi Germany would have to be bombed from U.S. bases. The Air Corps called for a speed of 400 miles an hour, a range of 5,333 miles, and a 2,000-pound bomb load. It was an audacious gamble on the part of the Air Corps and of the Boeing Company. Boeing was perhaps taking the greater chance. The Air Corps could hedge its bets with other manufacturers for less ambitious airplanes. But Boeing had to rely not only on its own capability, 
It also had to trust its vendors. Many of them were being asked to create components fully as advanced as the aircraft itself. Shortcuts had to be taken. Each one added to an already ambitious program. Dollars were freely available, but they were not always a solution. Standard gun turrets could not be used. The armament had to be remotely operated. A General Electric fire control system had to be created. It used an early computer that compensated for speed, range, altitude, wind, temperature, and trajectory. The results were remarkably good. Any gunner, apart from the tail gunner, could control more than one station. The computer permitted firing at targets beyond the range of conventional hand-operated guns. Demand for the Boeing B-29 increased. Rival firms, Bell Aircraft and Glenn L. Martin, were tasked to build it. Boeing felt it was being asked to train competition for the post-war marketplace. By the time the XB-29 made its first flight on September 21, 1942, the USAAF had placed a mammoth order for 1,664 of the aircraft. But the first two prototypes caught fire in the air. The second one crashed into a meatpacking plant. The entire crew was killed. In spite of all the difficulties, the first B-29 of the 58th Bombardment Wing landed at Karagpur, India on April 24, 1944 to begin Operation Matterhorn. Operation Matterhorn was designed to knock out the Japanese steel and beyond the imagination of any of the visionary pre-war strategists. None of the Japanese or American planning had been conducted with any idea of the two weapons which would bring the war so completely and so suddenly to an end. The Boeing Superfortress and the atomic bomb. Conventional air power had gone a long way toward defeating the Japanese, but they were determined to resist an invasion with every weapon at their disposal. The Japanese were a homogeneous nation, 100 million strong. They were willing to die for their country and their emperor. The Boeing B-29 was the most expensive single project of World War II. It cost more than $3 billion for design, development, production, and deployment. The Manhattan Project, which resulted in the atomic bomb, cost $2 billion. The B-29 was clearly the most outstanding bomber of the war by any standard. The handsome, streamlined airframe was a radical departure from all previous Boeing practice. It involved new metals and new fabrication techniques. Boeing's entire production capacity was occupied with building the B-17. For the B-29, it was necessary to build entire new plants. And there was a greater challenge, the creation of a new, highly skilled workforce. Vast schools were established on the factory sites. With 90 days of training or less, farmers, housewives, and young people just out of high school were taught how to do everything necessary to build the most complex aircraft in history. By 1943, Boeing had 58,000 employees building the B-29. Boeing knew from the start that the greatest question mark was the unproven engine. The 18-cylinder Wright R3350 used two General Electric turbochargers to develop almost one horsepower for each pound of engine weight, 
The R3350 needed several years more development than was available. It would go into the field unready. It would be a constant nightmare to mechanics and a worry to pilots taking off with too heavy loads from too short runways. Even with the R3350's power, the speed and range requirements were difficult to attain. They could only be achieved by combining a highly streamlined design with a wing using a new Boeing high-lift airfoil and a sophisticated flap system. The USAAF thought Boeing's approach was too radical. They thought the wing loading was too high and that pilots wouldn't be able to handle the airplane. They cited the experience of the notorious Martin B-26 as an example. Boeing analyzed the B-26 and found that it had a low aspect ratio wing mounted on the fuselage in a way that induced drag. They explained that the B-26's problem stemmed from bad design. They said that the B-29's excellent design would avoid difficulties. To achieve the necessary performance, the B-29 had to operate at high altitudes. For this, pressurization of the fuselage was mandatory. Boeing had experimented with pressurization in the Model 307 Stratoliner passenger plane, but no production bomber had ever been pressurized. The B-29 adopted a new three-bubble system. The pilot, co-pilot, engineer, radio operator, and navigator were in the front pod. The gunners were positioned in the mid-fuselage pressurized area and connected to the cockpit by a tunnel spanning the twin bomb bays. The tail gunner was crammed into a third pressurized compartment in the rear, isolated and very much alone. Because of the pressurization system, standard